lesson 12 together but I decided to just go ahead and merge those two just for time constraint and um, so the lesson 12 I think is very helpful for you it basically goes through the history of uh, transgenderism and how we got to the point we're at right now um, very very helpful in us understanding things culturally but um, trying to work through that today we just don't have time so I encourage you to do that on your own and then 13 and 14 we're gonna go over next week as we try to condense things um, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and give you a, a disclaimer today <clears throat> not a disclaimer but rather a warning um, I think sometimes when we talk about things like we've been talking about, transgenderism, um, homosexuality, things of that nature, until we actually see some of the things that are taking place, in our minds we, we, we say, okay, yeah, I know that that's not right. But really when you begin to go a little bit deeper on these things, and, and even hear from the, from the people's mouths who are espousing these things, um, it is, it's shocking. We have a sense in us that doesn't want to let our minds go as far as things are actually going today. So the reason I say that is I've debated as to how, um, how much we should talk about when it comes to the aspect of transgenderism. It is a mixed audience um, you know sometimes we shy away from hard conversations um, but I have decided to just let some of the language that the people are using to be broadcast um, just so you can see explicitly what people who are believing transgender ideology and even have so-called transitioned to another gender another sex so you can see what they actually believe and how some of this process is uh, done. So full warning, this is, um, I, I think will be a shocking lesson. And I'm not doing that for shock factor only, but envision today's lesson like learning about the Holocaust. Okay, you can learn facts about it. But when you visit the Holocaust Museum, and you actually see what took place it leaves a deeper impression on you and I think sometimes we do need to be somewhat shocked out of our callousness of things like this so full warning that's that's where we're going today so I want you to pray for me as we begin here um, just so we can deal with this topic in, in truth and grace and uh, that we will all understand how devastating this is let's pray our father we do ask that today that you would give us insight and wisdom into this topic that we are studying and looking at and i pray that you would help us um, just to be discerning people in a day where there is very little discernment even in the church there's little discernment and less backbone we pray that you would help us um, to be both discerning, bold, and very cognizant of our own weaknesses, to be quick to listen, quick to repent, but also help us be clear in what we speak. And we ask that as we come to this topic today that you would help our understanding to be uh, enlightened Help us to see what, what Scripture says about transgender ideology and what we see going on in our culture. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so this morning we're looking at Lesson 11, which is Gender Dysphoria, Treatments, and the Gospel. Okay. How does all of this fit together? Um, I wanted to give you a, a kind of a recommendation for parents here, <coughs> adults. Uh, Steve had mentioned this video to me it's a documentary by Matt Walsh and uh, Daily Wire is that who he works for yeah Daily Wire he works for Ben Shapiro and all those guys um, Matt is a Roman Catholic he doesn't approach the subject of transgenderism from a biblical perspective per se it's just more a 
common understanding of biology and letting people that are on the hard left just talk and say what they actually believe. Um, you can find this documentary on Rumble, and I would encourage you parents, adults, to watch that. I don't think your kids need to watch that necessarily, um, but it is shocking. As you go through it, um, you'll notice that within the first hour of the video, there's, there's some comedic elements to it because you let people on the hard left that are really promoting transgenderism just speak and you ask question after question after question, it gets to a point where you realize that what is being taught and believed is sheer idiocy. Um, there's just no other way to say it. But, but he takes it from, from that and just letting people talk to as you get to the end of it, you begin to see the devastation that is being brought into people's lives who believe this. And I, as I watch the documentary, it's almost like a switch is turned about halfway through um, to see just how, how paralyzing this is for many people. So I wanted to throw that out to you. I think it's even in the notes that are there. Um, it, it is worthwhile, um, but it is obviously explicit content, okay? All right, so uh, a few questions that we're looking through, and uh, as we, we have the gender ideology book. Uh, first question is, read pages 26 to 31 in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and explain what gender dysphoria is, okay? So here's 1 Thessalonians 5. We turn there in our Bibles, if you have your Bible there, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Uh, it says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see in this verse clearly that God has made human beings with an inner person and an outer person. Okay, The outer person is the body the physical expression of who we are, that's what people see us as, they recognize us, because we have that body. Now, on the inside, uh, Christian teaching tells us we have a soul. This is where we have intellect, emotion, will. It's where we make our decisions. Really, the soul is who we are. The body is the vehicle that allows us to be who we are and express who we are um, from our very souls. So you see that here, and Paul's prayer is that there would be a unity, a sanctification, if you will, of body and spirit. And ultimately, the way that God has created us is that the soul and the body are to be united in the way they work and the way they function. Now, how when we come to this aspect of gender dysphoria, and transgenderism, this gets to the heart, really, of this verse, because there is a discontinuity in people's minds who struggle with transgender ideology or transgender identification, if you will, because what they're saying, in essence, is my mind and my body do not align. So, what, what do you do at that point? Well, that's the first question, in essence, we're looking at. Okay, so this is what the book says. Gender dysphoria means that a person is unhappy with their biological sex. They believe they would more truly be themselves if they were able to live as a member of the opposite sex, or it is neither male nor female, as some chose, have chosen other identity. So basically what gender dysphoria is, is somebody that, that, that is struggling with their physical biology, that they have been made a man or a woman, and mentally they feel like they would be happier if they would transition to being the opposite uh, biological sex with which they were born. Okay, So let's, uh, let's kind of drill down on some things here. And this is kind of where it gets shocking. Two things that... Uh, kind of from that statement will lift out. Number one, biological sex. And then number two, truly themselves. 
Here's some terminology we, un, we need to unpack. As Christians, when we think of sex and gender, we do not see a disconnection there. Okay, so if somebody comes up to you and says, what's your sex? You say, well, I'm a man. And what's your gender? Well, I'm a man. Or, what's your gender? I'm a woman, sex, woman. We use those terms interchangeably. But what's happened in our culture today is sex and gender have now been disconnected. Okay, so... You can be biologically one thing, but as far as your gender is concerned, you can identify as something else, okay? Now, like I said, full disclosure, some of this stuff is going to be shocking if you haven't read some of this stuff before. All right, so uh, sex is your biology. Um, is anybody in here, like, really good at biology? Anybody, like, like yeah, what? Okay, that's, that's asking you to step into a bragging realm, all right? Does anybody really enjoy biology, okay? But when it comes to biology, that is, like, without question, my, my worst subject, okay? Like, are you smarter than a fifth grader? No, I'm not. I'll just walk off the show now. Um, I have a very elemental understanding of biology. But when it comes to biology... Male and female is determined by the chromosomes that you have. And this, uh, the chromosomes that you have, either XX for women, XY for men, um, that is knit into the very fiber of your, your cell makeup and your DNA. So from how I understand it, literally everything in you, <clears throat> as far as your cell makeup is concerned, in your chromosomal structure, Everything in you says, I am a man, I am a woman, all right? So from your birth until your death, your cell structure is telling you constantly this is what you are, okay? That is biological sex. That is what we are born with. Um, so that's terminology number one. Sex is your biology. Now here's where the differentiation comes in with the secular world. Gender is your perception or your identity of who you are. Now, this is a, a website that I saw, and I don't know how reputable this website is, but honestly, this is, for all intents and purposes, this is the way that, that the world is thinking right now, okay? Uh, this is scienceline.org um, on the whole topic of chromosomes. It says this, gender is subjective to each person. And sex organs don't dictate gender. People with penises aren't necessarily men, and people with vaginas aren't necessarily women. Now, if you haven't read something like that before, when you see that, you're thinking to yourself, how in the world could somebody come to that conclusion? Well, the reason is there is a disconnection between what people are thinking today with biological sex and how you identify mentally as far as your gender is concerned. So no more is it when a baby comes out, you look at the private parts and you say, okay, this is a boy, this is a girl. Biologically, they may be that, but down the road, they may want to change that. All right. Whereas that's really never happened, the history of man. Now that's going on regularly. That's what people are being taught academically, at the highest levels in our culture today. All right, so that's kind of the terminology, the distinctions on gender. Conclusion is, is what your biological sex and your psychological sex or your gender are not necessarily the same. That's more in essence the way the world looks at it. Now, when you, when you hear that, you, you think, what in the world? I mean... I, how is that possible? But I put this what up here, not just for that, but also what was it that kind of led us down this trail? What was it that got us started here? How is it that we've had such a transition of thought? Okay, um, This is called the dsm 4 It is the, the psychologist and the psychiatrist Bible. Okay, so um, when we come to church, we preach from the Bible. Right? Because this is our authority. Well, if you go to psychologist, psychiatrist, from a secular perspective, this diagnostic manual is their Bible. It is the go-to place that if they have a question, 
about how to counsel somebody, they go to that book. And that book is supposed to help them understand when a person's here, this is what you tell them. Okay. Now this is a copy of the DSM-4. It was written in 2000 and it was used until uh, 2013. Now in the DSM-4, uh, gender identity was still referred to as a disorder at that point. Now when you come to the DSM-5, which was just updated in 2013, they changed the language to, to not say gender disorder, but to say gender dysphoria. So this is what the DSM-5 says. Gender dysphoria refers to the distress that may accompany the incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and one's assigned gender. Okay, language matters here. When it comes to dysphoria, dysphoria is more talking about um, external stuff, stuff on the outside. Disorder is talking about something on the inside. So disorder is saying your mind needs to change. Dysphoria is saying your body needs to change. So if you have a problem with your body because it's not aligned to your mind, don't worry about fixing your mind, just fix your body. So that's how all of this came into play. Um, with, like we talked about a few weeks ago, 2015 Obergefell decision where homosexuality was made the law of the land as far as marriage is concerned, that, that really opened up the door for everything that we see taking place now. All right, so that's where we're at. Um, as we keep going, um, remember in the 90s, if you were a child of the 90s, you know that anorexia was a big thing. Anybody in here have a friend or a relative or something? Yeah, I went to church with a girl that... Um, I mean, she probably was five foot two, maybe weighed 90 pounds. And to the point where you could literally see her bone structure, she was a very short period of time away from death because she was anorexic. And what is it, that, what is it that's a problem with somebody that's anorexic? It's whenever they think about themselves and whenever they look in the mirror, no matter what they see, they always tell themselves, I'm fat. So, I'm not going to eat because what I'm looking at is fat. That's anorexia, right? That's a disorder. And how is it that you would counsel somebody that has a disorder? It is, look, we can see physically that you are not fat and literally you're starving yourself to death and if you don't change this behavior you are going to die what's the difference now between somebody that's anorexic they are denying a reality that everyone can see that is true that everyone knows what's the distinction between anorexia or, or what's the difference in how we should treat people who are anorexic and people who um, or struggling with gender dysphoria. It's very simple. It's ideology. The ideology has changed from the point of saying, look, we don't need to worry about fixing your mind. Let's just take care of, of the body aspects. Gender theory has now changed to say that you only can know who you are. Remember last week, we, or last time we were together, we talked about that book, The Gender Fairy, which is one of the books that's out there that kids are being read before they go to bed and basically being indoctrinated um, into thinking that only they can know their gender. This is what this nighttime story uh, says in the, the gender fairy. Only you know whether you are a boy or a girl and no one can tell you. Only you can know that. All right, so that's question one. Um, you might have any thoughts on any of that so far? It only gets more shocking as we go. Yes, sir. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's no objective standard that we can go to anymore.
Yeah, right. I think it is such a full expression of rebellion against God to say, you know, it's, it's to a higher level than just saying, well, I don't believe Jesus rose again from the dead. I mean, at that point, you're, you're virtually rejecting everything you can objectively know about yourself. You know, when you're born, you're, you're born a man, born a woman, but when you say, I'm not even going to say that. And there may be some circumstances that are going on mentally there. But for the most part of what we see in the transgender ideology, that's not what's going on. It's not people who are really struggling with their, their actual gender makeup. It's people who are being kind of forced into this. And they're, they're seeing it as this is the cool thing to do. And that it's an ultimate expression of rebellion against God. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right. Why would you do that outside of sheer rebellion and depravity? Right. Yeah. All right. Let's hop to point two because we got a few more things here. Um, explain how treatments and understanding of gender dysphoria have changed in recent history. Okay, so here's what the book says um, when it comes to people who had gender, true gender dysphoria. And from the materials that I've read, this is something, and we'll look at it in just a second, it is not extremely prevalent of people who genuinely struggle with that. The story of the guy that we looked at a few weeks ago, Walt, uh, I think Hare is his name, um, his story is very rare where, where somebody actually feels as though they are the wrong gender in throughout their teenage years even into adulthood it does happen but it is rare now the one thing that the book tries to emphasize if you let nature take its course it will naturally correct it okay so here's what the book says there's a totally natural way of resolving gender uh, children's gender confusion it's called puberty when children do genuinely experience discontent with their biological sex, this revolves, uh, resolves in up to 90% of cases if puberty is allowed to take its course. If you allow testosterone to kick in for boys and estrogen to kick in for girls, in the vast majority of cases, gender confusion is resolved. So what is the natural, God-given way that gender dysphoria clears itself up. Yeah, it's through growing up. Yeah, and just letting, letting nature take its course. All right? So, but that is not, that is not the normal treatments now. And we'll, we'll, we'll it's kind of shocking as we get into this. So what about the 10%? What's there? Uh, the book says this, professional counseling obviously is number one. There are some people who are, um, followers of Christ that deal with this stuff on a regular basis. And there, there are still some people who are, you know, professional psychologists and psychiatrists that are coming at this from more of a secular perspective that still look at the, you know, gender ideology stuff as, as complete insanity. I, I, honestly, I don't know if they're few and far between or not, but I, I do know that that's probably not the prevalent view at this point. Um, but also they talk about parental counseling. I think we live in a day and age where we think 
some specialist is going to have to take care of something. You know, we're kind of taught that from the early, so let's let the specialist handle this. And yeah, certainly, there, if you need brain surgery, don't call your brother, unless your brother's a brain surgeon, right? But, but reality is, as parents, we are the ones that God has given wisdom to. God has given us the responsibility to help our kids with the difficulties that they go through in life. So talking about parental counseling, this is what they said, firmly but kindly and patiently insist that your child is a member of his or her birth sex. You should not allow your child to engage in behaviors such as cross-dressing uh, and fantasy play as the other sex. Above all else, you should not let your child socially transition to the other sex. So as a parent, just stay on course. All right, um, there's also something called rapid onset dysphoria. Okay, I didn't know this until I read the book. But rapid onset dysphoria is something that's more a cultural movement. All right, it's like, um, and, and according to the book, in it, it, the Five Lies book I recommended by Rosaria Butterfield, she talks about this there as well, where is, especially girls are prone to this, where if in mass... The peers that are around, um, boys, girls especially, are all kind of doing something, then everybody feels like, well, that's probably the direction that I need to go. And if your you know, kids are on TikTok for six, seven, eight hours a day, then they're going to be constantly being discipled into transgender ideology and how only you can know who you really are. And if you hear that enough, what are you going to begin to think? Well, who am I really? And then there's so much confusion that's brought out of that. And there are places on YouTube that you can go, and kids are being taught how to transition and how to keep this kind of stuff away from their parents so their parents don't know, which is another reason why we as parents have got to be engaged with our kids on the social media stuff, uh, the internet that they consume, all of that stuff. Because inadvertently, they could get into it and then, you know, get, get messed up with it. Uh, okay, so I bring back the anorexia thing because uh, Butterfield in her book on um, Five Lies of the uh, Anti-Christian World, she says it, and I didn't realize this, but in the 90s, anorexia was something that really was kind of rapidly on set. Because there were so many people who were struggling with it, especially girls that were in communities with other girls that were struggling with anorexia, they began to be confused themselves, and they began to think about this kind of stuff. Um, this is not a great theologian, okay? <laughs> Bill Maher. Anybody know Bill Maher? Uh, he's had an HBO comedy show for like 50 years. I don't know how this happened, but I saw a, a, a reel on Facebook some time ago from Bill Maher, and his stuff got regularly looped in to my Facebook feed. And it is amazing that Bill Maher, who is an atheist and somebody who at one point would have been viewed on the hard left, now sounds like a conservative <laughs> in our day and age. And I saw a reel that he was, he was basically pushing back on you know, all the transgender stuff, and he said, look, transgender is, this is coming from an atheist who makes his living making fun of people. And he said, what transgenderism is right now in America is peer pressure. In the 90s, in the 80s, the 70s, there were things that we did in rebellion to buck against our parents, right? Every generation has that. And Mars' point was, this transgenderism is the rebellion of teenagers today. And they're seeking to break against their parents and break the norm because it's kind of the end thing to do. And he makes the point, you know, if you're a teenager and you do this, and he's coming at it from a secular perspective, he said if you're a teenager and you do that, you may be happy 20 years from now, but you may not. So don't make that decision when you're 15, 16 years old. Obviously, as Christians, we would come at it from a little different perspective. But anyway, um, that's, that's Bill Maher. All right, so now, what is the treatments? Treatments, at one point, would have been counseling, would have been just let nature take its course, it'll fix itself. 
Now the advisable treatments are surgeries and hormones, okay? Hormone injections will make, some, uh, will make people begin to experience some aspects uh, of the opposite sex. Boys will begin to grow breasts if they're given female hormones. Girls will begin to grow facial hair if they're given male hormones. Uh, surgery, the removal and or construction of female or male sexual anatomy. Now this is a quote that was given from the, um, the Matt Walsh documentary I mentioned a minute ago, so I don't have hard facts on this. But one person is on the video transitioned. And uh, he was a, a woman, transitioned to being a man, and he is now an advocate against all of it. And he said that 67% of people that have the sex change surgery have complications from it. And it costs $70,000 to go about having that procedure in and of itself. And I think he made the point that if, if, that if a young person gets sucked into that transgender orbit, it's a $1.3 million transaction for the transgender community. Just coming into it through all the treatment, because once the sex change is done... It's not as if that person just lives a healthy life. They regularly have to be checked up for infections and um, urinary discharge. Many of them have to wear a bag for the rest of their lives. So what we're talking about here is not a, a surgery that just takes care of everything. We're not talking about surgery that fixes something. We're talking about surgeries that cause a lot of complications and a lot of difficulty. Okay. Um, when we think about drugs, look, there's so many out there. Who knows what anything even is, right? I'm sure you have not heard of the drug Lupron. Uh, what is Lupron? Well, Lupron's used for a handful of things. Used for prostate cancer in men. Um, Lupron is also used to chemically castrate sex offenders. So if it's if it's a man that's been a rapist, a pedophile, something along those lines. In the past, Lupron has been given so that they can no longer commit those sexual acts of deviance. You know what else Lupron is used for? It's used for transgender boys that want to become girls. So in essence, the same drugs that are given to sex offenders to make them not be able to um, do sexual offenses is now given to boys who want to become girls so it will completely destroy um, their, their insides and their sexual organs. This is a picture here that basically looks like somebody was in a motorcycle accident. But this picture is basically what every person that is a woman that tries to become a man now has. Okay, and I put this picture up here because I want you to understand just how serious this is. Okay, now, if a, if a woman, uh, if a man wants to become a woman, I think we understand how that process goes. There's a surgical procedure, and their private parts are going to be taken off, and they're going to be having to be, ha try to have something constructed that looks like a female part. But what happens to a woman that wants to become a man? Well, they take skin off of that person's arm, they take muscle off of that person's arm or their thigh or their buttocks, and they form a male private part from that. So ultimately, what that person has, they, they construct it to look like the male anatomy. And I don't say that to be vulgar. I say that because probably most of us have not seen this on the 6 o'clock news. And it's shocking when you hear this. But friends, that is what's going on right now. And that is the process of how women become transgender men at that point. Okay, here's, um, here's a, a quote from the book. Uh, and basically it's talking about a, a man that wants to become a woman. This was an article that was published in the New York Times, and the, the, the title of the article was, My New Vagina Won't Make Me Happy. 
And this is what the person says. This was an article that was written, if I remember correctly, the day before they went in to have sex change surgery. It says, until the day I die, my body will regard the vagina as a wound. As a result, it will require regular, painful treatment to maintain. This is what I want, but there's no guarantee that it will make me happier. In fact, I don't expect it to. But that should not disqualify me from getting it. It's amazing, isn't it? That people are thinking this way and articulating this. And society is getting behind it completely. Uh, again, the quote from Butterfield, transgender surgery is gothic Frankensteinianism. Um, we said a few weeks ago that the transgender surgery and the way they view the body is like meat Legos. If it doesn't fit here, we'll just make something out of it. We'll, we'll move in another direction, okay? Here's another question um, that was asked in the Matt Walsh documentary. The, the lady that he's there with, I believe, is a, a pediatrician, and, and she's, she's helped kids transition from boys to girls and girls to boys. And Matt Walsh asked the question. He says, at what age is a person ready to transition? And she said, well, kids can know who they are from the very earliest of ages. And we can't tell them who they are. Only they can know that. So then he says, so you're telling me that a child, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, that believes that a man in a red suit and a white beard that goes around the world on Christmas night and delivers presents that person is ready to make a decision for the rest of their life as to what sex they are. You know what her response was? She said, well, Santa Claus may be real to them. This is somebody who is, who is instructing children. Friends, that should be criminal <laughs> to give people that kind of advice in the name of social justice or UBU or... Whatever the case is, it's absolutely shocking. This is what's going on. Is there any hope? Well, uh, this is what Butterfield says about people who really struggle with gender dysphoria. Christians who have a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria have the hope of the gospel, progressive sanctification, the community of the church, the means of God's grace, and biblical counseling from church elders and other health professionals. There is hope in the gospel. Look, when we look at our world right now, it, it is easy to look at everything glass half empty, right? What in the world? There's no hope here. This is just the people who have the wrong ideology are the ones that have got all the money. They're the ones that have all the power right now. But the power of the gospel is so much greater than the power of money or the power of politics or the power of having a seat in Congress. And what our, our country needs is the gospel. That's where the hope is. All right? Any questions or thoughts on any of that? It's rather shocking stuff, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And even to the to the extent talking about that, kids are now ad identifying as animals. You know, in the public school system, and and they're. Um, there are even like litter boxes in some places that are being set aside for people that identify as cats. What do you, I mean, <laughs> and not much to even say, right? It's just insanity. It's absolute insanity.
Yeah. Because what do you get from what, what do you get real wisdom you get from a man who wants to become a woman? Well, there's many ways to make good body shots from Buddha. A person who spent a lot of energy to learn how to make it, or the woman who wants to become a male and never be able to fall into their shallow. Yeah. So when reasonable minded proposers go to talk with people who are approaching different gender, if somebody just asks Yeah. Because the assumption of a man and a woman is this, it's just futile. Yeah. Because people will follow you. Yeah. And there's no logical end no. to any of that. No. So why why couldn't I identify as a sixty five year old, you know, man who's worked all my life and go collect social security and smoke cigars on the beach from now on, you know? That's the life, you know what I mean? Um but why what what at what point do you go down the road and say, well, hey, I just I'm I'm a 65-year-old trapped in a 41-year-old body. Or or your ethnicity. I mean, who's to say? There's 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 no limit to that. And even like people identifying as animals. The Matt Walsh documentary I mentioned, like he identi- he he interviews somebody who identifies as a wolf. And they try to have a conversation. And he said, you know, do you, do, you, do you understand what a wolf is saying? He said, yeah, I understand. I, I can communicate with them. And he said, would you mind giving us a demonstration of that? And he said, no, I don't think I'd feel comfortable doing that. And I'm like, yeah, I wonder why. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, it, yeah it's, it, it is it is. It is, when you look at it on its surface and you get to its logical end, it's comedic. But it is devastating that people actually believe this. Um, Yeah. Right. I think there's a distinction in cordiality and kindness and affirmation. And and that's that's where the dividing line really is in culture right now. It's not a matter of being able to walk away and have a gentleman's disagreement. You must affirm this and you must accept that. So from a theological perspective, if somebody is choosing to live this way, that is a clear rejection of what God has said. How do you begin to make inroads with that individual um, if you see someone like that? I, I do think cordiality, you know, we, shouldn't, we should not be rude and John Wayne kick the door down to people, but at the same time, we have to speak truth. And the truth hurts, but the truth is not unkind. And I think that's people people do need to hear it. And, and the conversation is going to be based on the level of knowledge that you have with somebody. And you know, the, and the more trust you have, the more you can further explain. Jeremy, I saw your hand up.
Yeah. Yeah. What? I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, it it become it goes from a hypothetical conversation in a Sunday school class to real life. This is what you're faced with, and it's it's all around us. And to your point, you know, about somebody being 55 and getting trapped in that. Um, the the going back to the documentary of Matt Walsh, he the guy that he interviewed that had transitioned from a woman to a man, um, he, he even says, you know, they got me, talking about the transgender community, he said, they got me at the age of 40. And he said, if your kids are watching TikTok and YouTube seven, eight hours a day, they don't have a prayer. And I think he's right. See? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's more or less the crux of the message this morning, um, pious hypocrisy, um, which is we're easily prone to, but we can't deny truth at the expense of knowing our own sin, you know. Yep. All right, we are out of time. Um, let's see. Yeah, we talk about gender, gen, uh, social construct there. Maybe we'll pick that up next week, um, and we'll kind of finalize talking about how how we can, as parents, um, especially, help with the transgendering of our children that we just see nonstop taking place, um, pretty much in every social venue. Let's end in prayer. I can find no other way to do it. Lord, we do ask that you would help us as we take these things that we talk about that are extremely heavy and help us to be people of hope because of the gospel, because Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, we have the hope that we will live in a new body and that our church can be strong in the truth of the gospel. Lord, all these questions that are given here, we ask that uh, wisdom would be made in decisions that we have to make, that you would help us to be truthful, help us to be gracious, and Lord, we do pray that you would send a revival in our land, a revival that changes people from the inside out to believe this message of hope. And we pray that you'd help us in our church to be a, truth, a church of grace and truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all.